name is uh, Clifford Stone. I retired as a, a sergeant first class from the U.S. Army. I was born in Portsmouth, Ohio. I have had an interest in UFOs since I was about, oh, seven, eight years old when I had my first initial experience that I could readily identify as a UFO, as a UFO event. Uh, prior to that, I had strange things happening to me, which I didn't actually tie those to UFOs and I didn't tie them to anything of extraterrestrial origin. Actually, I thought of more along the lines of something being supernatural. It scared me, but then I realized there was nothing I could do about it. So from a very early start in life, all the way up to and including the present, I've been involved in UFOs and I had strange events. And people will tell you that if you spend time at my house for any length of time, you will have strange events happen to you. We have attempted to shoot down UFOs in the past uh, with little effect. We actually shot pieces off, but during that time there were mechanical problems with them. The reason that you cannot go ahead and shoot a UFO down, the reason you don't have no sonic boom, you have a quarter of an inch of a perfect vacuum all the way around the airframe. Totally imp you cannot penetrate that vacuum. No weapon known to man can penetrate it. Now do they have countermeasures where if they were up against a uh, alien craft that was a threat to them that had the same technology, do they have measures where they could go ahead and neutralize it on the enemy spacecraft? I don't know. But I do know that that right there is the one thing that protects them and also provides for them to travel through our atmosphere at a speed far greater than the speed of sound without breaking the sound barrier. The cases that I was involved in, the 12, three actually involved crash retrievals. The three crash retrievals had bodies with them and some of the entities were still alive which was necessary to treat them, which is why there's the catalog that deals with the various species. The catalog exists because rendering first aid to our visitors is quite unique and different from what we would consider first aid. You had medics there who would go ahead and take care of uh, those people, but they needed that section that dealt with the cataloging and what types of food that they could be fed. Actually we use, I'm going to say the word wrong, but we use synthesized food. We did not give them the food that we normally eat and take for granted every day. It could actually be poisonous to them. First aid, the way we give first aid, could actually cause their death. So we had to know how to administer specifically the things that was needed to, to preserve their life, if at all possible. The other thing is, when you went to a, a crash retrieval, you always was going against the clock. Because just like us, when we have a plane go down, there's an emergency beacon sent out. When one of their craft go down, there is an, an emergency distress call that goes out to their people and immediately they try to recover. And on more than one occasion, the military and their people have gotten there at the same time. The best thing to do when that happens is for us to back off because they are going to do everything they can to protect their people and recover the bodies and recover any of the injured or those that are still alive. Uh, they're not going to try to take overt hostile acts towards us. Many of the species on an individual basis would permit themselves to be killed before they would have any of us hurt. Not all the species are that way, but many are. Uh, the self-preservation that we have uh, isn't the same with them. 
that doesn't mean they want to die. It doesn't mean that they don't feel fear just like we do. And I can tell you they feel fear. I can tell you they really feel fear at times. And it shouldn't be that way with us. It should be that they know that we want to help them, but then again, the greed of man comes into play. What they have, we want. And the only way we can get it, we must learn from them. And if it means going through interrogation, things of this sort, and doing unethical things, because there aren't any laws that protect them, your pet retriever has more rights than any ET has. Knowing that, that is one of the reasons we're in quarantine. There is nothing that would stop us if we were to become, in the matter of the next couple of years, interplanetary travelers, meaning visiting other solar systems. If we achieve that and we go to a place that's got life very similar to the life here on Earth, and even an sentient, intelligent life that is on par to man but looks a little different, we could do anything we wanted to there in the interest of furthering our scientific knowledge and not even think about the moral issues of what we're doing to the life on that planet. The only thought we would have is the precautions we needed to take to ensure when we left that planet we did not come back here and infect our planet with a very deadly disease. That's been in place since actually before the uh, crash here in Roswell. That was in place during the Second World War because it was during the Second World War that in the Pacific Theater that they came into possession of things that were of extraterrestrial origin. And if you're not very careful when you go to a crash site, you run into the possibility of having casualties. Not because they are hostile, but because you have to be very careful with the equipment that they have on board the craft. The great art of reading, it's dead. People want to be told, this is the truth. The, the one message that I cry out all the time, let nobody live in your mind rent free. Make sure of these things. Read, in my case, I always allude to the documentation. And I'm always being told, people don't want to read the documentation. What do the people want then? Do they want to go ahead and hide their head in the sand like an ostrich? Or do they want to be enlightened by the sun that is shining bright in day? One, you can have somebody tell you these are the facts. That doesn't make it so. You can get the documents that have the pedigree that paint a story that show that something is going on. Then how that interrelates with your life to what degree of experiences have you had, then you put those together. But first you search out the truth. Then when you find out that you have had things happen in your life, or if you already know you were involved with these things, you owe it to your family and to yourself to tell them what happened in your life, why you weren't there for that ball game, why you weren't there for maybe the first steps of your child, maybe at the time of the birth of your child, but the times that you weren't there because you were out in the service of your country and it was things you were never to talk about. Now that you're out, you want to live a normal life, so you're never going to bring it up, but it's eating at you from within inside. It's also eating away at your family. You need to let them know what really happened.
the initial situation was at uh, Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. We went there on a field training exercise. Uh, being a civil affairs unit, they had certain scenarios they had to play out. Well, while we were there at that particular location, we were notified that there was an NBC incident that occurred and that a plane went down and it had radiological equipment on it, or radiological weapons. So we had to move out. There was already a team there when we got there and they had everything set up. But once we got there and upon our arrival, uh, as we got closer and closer to the mound of Earth, we could see that there was an aircraft there. But none of us could identify what the craft was. I drove a deuce and a half because the deuce and a half had all my field equipment, uh, the radios, the switchboard, uh, the NBC equipment. Uh, up on getting there, uh, they went ahead and told me that, you know, they wanted me to go towards the object itself and uh, take radiological readings. I went towards it, and as I got closer and closer, the readings would go up, but then they'd go down, up, down. I now know why that happened. It's the, pro the propulsion system. The propulsion system they use will initially give off a lot of background radiation, but it dissipates in a matter of minutes. But they want me to go ahead and get as close to the object as I could. So I kept going, and I got up to where I could look down into the mound where it was at. Uh, the crap was like a hill shape, and uh, they had a canopy, but on each side of the canopy. And the only way I can describe it is like a kidney-shaped hatch that was open, and there was a body lying out there, and you could immediately tell it wasn't human. Uh, I started to call for an officer because I needed an officer to come there to see what I was seeing. This wasn't real. This wasn't something that was supposed to be happening. And they told me, no, just describe what you're seeing. And I said, no, I really need an officer up here. I said, you don't understand. I really need an officer up here. Uh, no one came. Eventually they said, that's fine, son, come on back down. Then they told me to go back into the deuce and a half, that some field phones had already been set up from there. I would operate the switchboard at SP-22, and I was to stay there until I was later notified to come out that all rations of the day would be sea rations, and there were sea rations in the truck. I wasn't to look out of the truck or nothing else from that all, that point on. So that was the initial start. And from there on, there were other events that occurred. A lot of people think that you're in a unit just waiting for the next UFO event. That's not it. You actually had a real job you did in the military. But you had a double life. And on more than one occasion, we had situations where we were called out. There in the United States, I had several. In Germany, I had several, which covered all of Europe. In Vietnam, we had several instances. But I think the biggest thing about going on these events was you couldn't talk to nobody. You had to keep it bottled up. You couldn't tell your family what you were doing. Being a clerk, I shouldn't go all that TDY. I shouldn't be gone for weeks, months at a time. My kids, they didn't understand that. And just this last, last month, I went on vacation. And my two sons were throwing it up to me about, Dad, you missed out on a lot of vacations with us. And I tried to explain to him it wasn't because I didn't want to be there. But I've already told them events that happened. And my oldest son started to recall what I had said prior with the death of my son uh, in 95, because then I started to tell them. 
my granddaughter, I think I've told the most to because she asks. And she really took an interest in what I was saying about what happened. But I think people that were involved in this, the people who went out there and did the recoveries, who seen the things that they have to live with day to day, they really need to tell their families. I got disillusioned with it when I found out the things we were doing to people. I got disillusioned with it when I found out, knowing the truth, we would cause people to lose their families, lose their jobs, and at times they'd even take their lives. And to me, there was nothing right about this. What purpose can it serve? by telling these people who've had these events, who actually were the response people who went to these locations where these events took place, to try to tell them that there's a prosaic explanation when they knew better. But the end result, they're traumatized and there isn't no help out there. If you go and tell somebody about a UFO event or experience you had, Immediately, your sanity comes into question. Immediately, people question your integrity. And that's what these people have to deal with. So what do you do? You bottle it up and you say nothing. That's the safe thing. But it really isn't safe because it comes back to haunt you. So right now what I would like is for people who have been out there, who have been involved in this, to tell their families what they were involved with. I had an officer, and a lot of you people in the field know me. When I talked in Washington, D.C., he was involved in an incident. He came up and he asked me, how did they talk? I said, you heard them in your head. I said, it was just like you and I talking right now and you thought you were hearing voices, but you heard them in your head. And I told him that in, during the event that you went through, you probably heard them say something like, do not be afraid, we are not going to harm you. Nothing bad is going to happen, but it is necessary we show what we could do if we were really here with hostile intent. He acknowledged that. He never told anybody, no one, about that, not even his family. And he acknowledged, yes, that's exactly what happened. And I've never told no one. And I said, what are you going to do about it? And he said, I'm going to go home, hug my wife, tell her I love her, and tell her what happened. And to the best of my knowledge, there's a couple of people who, in the field that know about that, but they've never reached the name of that person. And that's the way it needs to be. It's up to that individual to come forth and tell what really happened, the, the rest of the story. I tell you I've seen a UFO. I tell you that we made a report about it that certain things happened, I can be comfortable with that. And you can accept that, whether you believe in extraterrestrials or not. But when I tell you the rest of the story, then it becomes diff very difficult for the person to really comprehend what a person went through. Also, it becomes very difficult for the person who has decided to come out of the closet, so to speak, and state that for 20 plus years I was involved in a program involving the recovery of, tra of crashed UFOs and debris thereof. Crashes are very rare, very rare. The recovery of debris or items left behind are not so rare. To be sure, they're pretty common. A person that's involved in an incident one time as this person was. It becomes very difficult for them to tell the whole story, even when they want to. 
but there are those in order to have peace of mind, starting with family, they need to tell. And I guess that's the message I want to get out. I have been face to face with visitors from other planets other than here. I had one that's very, very close. Like I say, it stays with me. Uh, that individual is called Corona, and it was made clear, always spell it with a K. I don't know what difference it makes, but I was told my name is Corona with a K. So uh, that little entity, it's about four and a half, five foot tall. Uh, a lot of people tell me, well, can't you make him gray? No, I can't. He has a greenish tint to him. He has a very unique feature of his face where the skull is larger out here, then it comes into a smaller cheek. Uh, the eyes are like teardrop, but with the top of the teardrop toward the inside slanted a little like this. Two small slits for a nose and a slit for a mouth. Uh, lips are not dominant or anything like that on, on this particular entity. But yet, you can see emotion within his face. And I say him because during the times that we have had interaction, we have even talked about family situations. Most often, we don't go ahead and think of them being anything like us to where they have families. We think of them as being genetically create, created. That there's no longer that bonding between uh, the female and the male of the species. Well, there is. There is love there. It's not something that is missing from their society. They work towards the common good of their society. Unlike us, where a lot of times we are pulling at one another. There's competition, but the competition is working towards the common good. Not who can do the best job better. And I, I, it, it's so hard to put into words. It's almost like a beehive. All the bees in a beehive will work towards the common good of the colony within that hive. They do have their rogue elements, but when that happens, they are either extracted or killed within a beehive. In this case, they will refer to their being rogue elements that may be indifferent to the feelings of any other living creatures. When I was in the program, we were always told not all contact will be of a friendly nature. Now, the only time I've seen it where it wasn't of a friendly nature was when we were the ones that initiated the aggression. And it's very human to come up some, upon something that shocks your psychic, that shatters everything that you once believed and react hostile to that, that stimulus. And that has happened. Right now, we don't shoot at UFOs. We have chase planes, but they have the little crosshairs. In the past, when we chase planes and we try to take gun camera footage, when you activated your gun camera, all of your weapons were ready to fire on whatever it is that you were taking the photograph of. That can be registered. We can do that. We can say, okay, this person, for whatever reason, is getting a lock on us. And we don't know whether he's shooting at us with a camera or he's getting ready to unload missiles on us. So that's considered a hostile act, even by our standard. What we do nowadays is that we use the crosshairs where the pilot can go ahead, hit up on the crosshairs, whatever he's seeing in the center of the crosshairs, that's the center of what's going to show up in the gun camera footage. It doesn't go through any weapon system. Therefore, 
no hostile act can be registered or even be determined to be of such nature. The Russians have yet to learn this. The Russians have lost, by the time I got out, they'd lost 27 aircraft in the attempt to shoot down a UFO. The Chinese are getting a sad lesson on it now. They will shoot at anything that comes into their airspace. Now, it's not because they are taking defensive actions where they're shooting these planes down. It's just that sometimes when they use their defensive system, it has an adverse uh, impact on the aircraft fighters trying to shoot them down. But what happens is they bring these people into the programs and then they find a whole new world opening up to them. And it's a very scary world, a very lonely world. It's a world you can't share with nobody. Now there is a school, and they will send you to that school. I always fought not to go to that school. Because when I met the people who came back from that school, they were different. They were cold, they were callous. They didn't really care about what happened to certain other people. That people that they had to go and talk to, that these people, they were just numbers. They were a mission to make sure that they didn't talk. And whatever happened to the people, that was, that was not a problem of theirs, that wasn't a concern. They wound up killing themselves or start having me uh, mental problems. Then they would joke about it. And I thought this is a horrific thing that we're doing, that it shouldn't be that way. And ultimately, one case right, out, right here out, out of New Mexico, where they drove the person insane. And I kept trying to talk to the person, look, don't go down that road. But he trusted the very people that he knew were government agents not to cause that to happen. And trusted them emphatically. And at least one government agent feels pretty badly about what they did to that person. And everyone should. In short, we should be telling the people the truth that these people aren't crazy. They're having, from one degree to another, some type of interaction with our visitors. And we got people out there right now, John Q. Public, that has things bottled up in them. And I mean, this is a large number that have had interaction with our visitors to a more or less degree of some sort who have actually blotted it out of their memory. But they need to know what really happened. And when they start thinking about it, they don't really know where to go and search out answers. I can remember seeing the sky, the, the night sky, filled with stars. Yet, I don't remember it happening before or since. But I do know that I have been in many deserts, many dark areas on clear, crystal clear nights in which I could see many stars, but nothing like a couple of events in my life. And the only thing I could say was part of that I'm blocking out. I have to be blocking it out because the only way you could have seen all those stars is from a vintage point where you were not on this planet. That being said, I have no recollection of ever being abducted, uh, abducted. I have no recollection of ever being taken into space in one of their craft. But yet, I have clear memory of seeing the sky as, I was awed at it. 
but I can explain why I have that clear memory. I uh, don't know what was happening at that time. Uh, all I can say for sure, I was standing on level land. Uh, there were other things in my life that I have memory of that don't quite make sense. But when you go ahead and take into consideration the interaction that I know I've had with our visitors, and also know that it's a learning process, then we need to understand a little bit more about the relationship with our visitors and ourselves. Because through me, I don't have to be a genius, but everything I know, they know. Everything I see, they see. If you were over to my house, you would see thousands of CDs. The CDs have documents on them. A lot of subjects. A military subjects, space subjects, SDI, UFOs, but UFOs is just part of it. When I go ahead and download those, I'll scan them. I'm not even necessarily reading them. But I know as I scan those, they are picking up on what's there. So whether I have memory of everything that I've seen in the documents, they have memory of everything. And somehow, some way, using me, they can record that information and save it for prosperity. They can they also learn from that information, but they learn from us throughout life. If you're selected for them to, for lack of a better term, study, it starts at an early age, and they live long enough to mourn your death. And there's a reason I say mourn your death, because there's that relationship. It's hard to explain. It's not like your best friend or something like that. But there is that relationship. And that relationship is more like, is more human than what most people would think. But it's also with our visitors. It, it's hard to explain, it's hard to put into words. You're okay if you don't drudge it back up. But I have friends that are telling me I need to drudge it back up one time. But I feel so silly because I get, you can't hold the emotion back. And I have at times found myself wishing I could hate everyone and everything. And that way I wouldn't feel the compulsion to try to do something. And I know that's the wrong way to feel about it. But I can't hate. Even if I was to try to, I couldn't do that. I can't get angry with a person and stay angry with that person. I can get angry at a situation. I can feel frustration about a person's deportment or something like that. But I cannot go ahead and get angry, hold malice toward any individual. I, I guess it's just a situation where how do you stop it? How do you stop what's going on? How do you get it out there without the hard evidence to let people know these things are going on? I do know that UFO sightings really are, whether reported to the media, 
are there reported any place else? UFO sightings are on, the, are on an increase. Now, in the 50s and 60s, people would report lights in the night sky. Unless there is an event of real high strangeness, people don't report these incidences anymore. Once again, even in today's world, if you have an incident of high strangeness, you have the tendency not to report it. But I would suggest there's more going on than person just being within 500 foot of a circular craft or an unusual craft. There's more going on than that person just seeing that craft in a strange looking being next to it or looking up and seeing a craft and see a strange looking being looking out of, for lack of a better term, what they call a window. There's some segment there that's missing that they don't have full understanding of. But it will visit them at nights because they will have nightmares about it. And they won't understand the nightmares. They will be trying to find answers to certain uh, questions that have come up to them, not understanding the connection to the sighting. So there's more interaction going on than what people really know. And it's going on with a large number of people. And I guess what I'm saying is we really need to get those people to start talking. And it's not just gen uh, generic to the military, and the military doesn't have a handle on that. And it's not just generic to the U.S. It's worldwide. The government's covering up the knowledge that they have that UF some UFOs are, in fact, interplanetary spacecraft are interdimensional, multidimensional craft. Both can be one and the same. But we have a sentient life, much more evolved, much more intelligent than we are, that are visiting our planet. And we're keeping this information from the public. The problem with that is that there is no way any government on the earth can stop that interaction with these visitors to our planet with the people of our planet. For example, the reason they use me as an interfacer was because of the events that happened in my childhood and in my teen years. And somehow, someway, they knew about it. They can't teach this in school. They have to find people in the civilian sector to bring in to the fold, so to speak. I know for a fact that our government, with other, along with other governments, have some type of social intercourse with our visitors. But at the same time, I know that our visitors are partially responsible for why full disclosure has not taken place yet. And that's easily proven. Given that they are here, what power on earth could stop them from making themselves known if they wanted to? That being said, I feel that governments need to find a responsible way to start getting the information out that we are not alone in the universe. That there is other life out there. And that life is coming here visiting our planet. And it's p for pure scientific uh, purposes to try to gain a better understanding of us and hopefully enlighten us to the point where at some time in the future we don't wind up destroying ourselves. As a child, I had the situation where I'd have playmates that were invisible. Well, everybody has those, right? Everybody has imaginary friends. Only this was more than that. They wasn't imaginary, they were real to me. 
and they would always caution me, be careful what you say about us, others can't see us. But they looked very human. At the time, uh, I was always trying to help little animals. If I found an animal herd, I'd try to nurse it back. I found a little bird once, it had fallen out of its nest. And I took the bird, and it had broken its beak, so I took the bird and held it under a faucet, trying to wash away the blood, trying to help it. Of course, I drowned it. Now, in a child's mind, you know, they don't understand that birds die and God in his infinite wisdom uh, doesn't have a grieving process like we humans have when we lose a loved one. To me, I murdered that little bird. The mother and father are going to be missing their little baby all because of an action I did. And it really bothered me. I mean, I cried for weeks over that bird. But then, first time I see Corona, as he really is, he appears and he's startled. He wants to know why he's feeling what he is feeling. Why am I feeling what I'm feeling? Because as a result of what I'm feeling, he's feeling it. And I mean, the response, the response wasn't there. I screamed, you know, and I ran to try to find a place to hide. The question stood, why, why did I feel that way? I couldn't explain why I felt that way. After I overcame my panic, and that's what you would have to call it, because my aunt couldn't even control me. She tried to keep me in a chair, and I wanted to get out of that chair. I wanted to find a place to hide, but there was no place to hide. Where, where do you hide? Where do you run to? But the question, you know, why do you feel this way? Why is it that this bird died? Why do you feel such heavy grief, such heavy pain over doing that? And the other thing was, why do you try not to cry? Is crying not natural for your species? I'm a kid, I can't answer those questions. But, you know, eventually, the thought process, they were picking up on the fact that I was identifying this bird in human uh, contents, i.e. the taking the life of a child. Knowing firsthand, now at the time I didn't, I could only imagine, but knowing firsthand now, I can even understand a little better. But to me, the bird had a mother and father. The mother and father's gonna miss that bird, that their baby. And these were the emotions that was inside of me. When my son passed away, Corona, I think, mourned with me. And I always, even today, I visit his grave. But one day I was praying and Corona said, do you mind if I pray with you? And I said, not a problem, pray in your own way. And he got down on his knees just like we did. and people hate this part of it. But I said, do you have religion? And they said, religion? Isn't that something that's created by man? Do we have faith? Yes, we have faith. Do we believe that there is that which you call God? We accept that based on our science. It's no longer a faith-based idea that there is a creator, that which you call God, that truly is. Do you believe in life after death? Yes, they do. They even have means to communicate with their loved ones. It's not some parlor trick. 
they really have the means to do it. But there are forbidden questions that you can't ask about what happens after death. Otherwise, you ask that, you're cut off immediately. The one thing they cannot tell you, they, can't count, they cannot come up and tell you that this religion is the true and correct religion or that religion is the true and correct religion. You must worship in your own way. And at the time, at this time, I don't want really to go into why that was such a crucial question that I really needed answers for. And it deals with a, with a document that was out there that tied in with the connection with my, my son's death and what this document was alluding to. It was causing me a lot of mental anguish. Yet the answers was not offered. In short, I had to ask the questions. But it was brought about by the point of, why don't you ask these certain questions? It wasn't, well, we know what you want to know, so here's what the answers are. So it was played out, so to speak. And it was over a period of several days. And they even permitted me to see my son. Don't want to talk about that right now, but someday I really need to get that out. Because there were two times that that happened. And they're really beautiful stories, I think. But very hard for me to tell. Well, initially when I tried to enlist in the, in the military, I was found 4F. I went to Fort Hayes in Columbus, Ohio for my uh, uh, examination to go into the military. And that was in December 1967. Once I was there and I was take, took all the tests, passed all the tests with flying collars, but they found some medical problems and they said, you're never going to get in the military. At that time, they had the draft going on. I left Asheville, Ohio and moved back down to Portsmouth, Ohio. And once I got back down to Portsmouth, Ohio, in uh, late June, I received a letter directing me to report to Ashland, Kentucky for uh, reevaluation. And of course I knew it made no difference I wasn't going to get in. But when I got there, didn't lie on the form or nothing, but there was an officer there, a medical officer, who said, do you really want to end? Of course I did at that time. Uh, it was, I was very patriotic. It was God, country, mom's apple pie. If my country was doing something, it was okayed by God. That's the way I felt about it. But I managed to get, it, get in. The officer told me, he says, well, anytime you want out, all you have to do is tell him about your medical problems. And I said, you get me in, I'm not getting out. So once I got in, I went through basic, I went through AIT, uh, got my first duty assignment. But initially going through basic, nothing really happened other than just basic training. When I went to AIT, I went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Uh, their intelligence office there, they would send students that was taking schools there, they'd send them over to uh, different places for in work detail. On the fourth day of being there, I was sent to the intelligence office to do cleanup in there, empty the trash cans, mop the floors, buff them out, wax them. There was one gentleman there that was there on a special assignment from Washington, and we started to talk. When we started to talk, he started to show me things, and some of the things he showed me was photographs, some documents, and I knew what top secret meant at the time. I also knew I shouldn't be seeing him because I didn't have a top secret clearance. There were words that was uh, past the top secret, and I didn't understand what those words were at the time. I didn't understand in uh, parentheses at the beginning of every paragraph what that was all about. Uh, but I did know top secret. I did know I wasn't supposed to be seeing these. And initially he asked me, how do you feel about UFOs? Well, my mom didn't raise any fools, so I knew that military and UFOs didn't mix. So I said, oh, I don't give it much thought. And he laughed and says, come on, I don't really believe that. Everybody thinks about them. And I said, no, sir. 
And I said, I don't even think we should be carrying on this conversation. He says, well, let me show you some stuff. Then he showed me, and I said, sir, are you sure you should be showing me this? And he says, nope. I says, or, yes, I know I shouldn't be showing it to you, but you need to see it. I said, well, we could get in trouble, and I don't think I should look at it. And he said, okay, back up, regroup. I'm not showing you anything I'm not supposed to. You will understand later on. But I started to spend a lot of time doing this stuff, but I never went, never went to class. I never typed on a typewriter while I was there at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Yet when I got out, they said I could type 73 words a minute. When I went to my first duty station, which was at Fort Lee, Virginia, 36 Civil Affairs, I proudly advise my first sergeant that the one thing he should know about me, since I was a clerk typist, I couldn't type. And he looked at me kind of strange. And I uh, was going through my record, says, yeah, and obviously don't know the difference between the branches of service. Now, I didn't understand what he meant by, th by that, but he took my records, went in to see the unit commander. The unit commander came out. And he said, are you colorblind? And I said, no, sir. He says, what color uniform you have on? And I said, green, sir. He said, OK. And that's all that was ever said. And the first sergeant says, well, we have to put you someplace. He says, we need a unit NBC NCO. How would you like to be the unit NB NB NBC NCO? And that stands for Nuclear Biological Chemical Warfare. So I said, sure, I wouldn't mind doing that. He said, it requires no typing which wasn't actually true, it did. So what little typing it was required, I could hunt and pack on the typewriter. And I had an old Remington typewriter. They didn't have the electric typewriters at that time. So I went ahead, got that position, but in order to be in that position, you had to go to school. And the school lasted three weeks. So I was sent TDY to Fort McCollin, Alabama. Once I got to Fort McCollin, Alabama, I went, completed my school, I then came back to my unit. Once I got back to my unit, 36 Civil Affairs, uh, well, while I was at uh, Fort McCollin, I met a friend of mine that was, we hung around together all the time, and he was Army ASA, Army uh, Security Agency, and he was stationed out of Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and he uh, was directly assigned to the NSA. Anyhow, he invited me to come down uh, to visit with him sometime, and I said, sure, I'll try to do that. Anyhow, getting back to where I go back to my unit, I went to my unit, uh, started to set up my uh, office inside the NBC room. I also had uh, the requirement of taking care of our uh, communications equipment, like the switchboard, the field phones, uh, the uh, PRIC 25s, which were field radios, uh, the PRIC 46s, which were vehicle-mounted radios. And um, in the process of doing that, I was assigned to what was called an NBC Quick Reaction Team. Now, these were all over the United States. Nothing mystique about them uh, other than what their assignment is. Should there be an NBC incident or event, then you would go ahead and have one of these teams move out. And they had to move out in such a way that they had two different teams. Even today, it's the same way. They had A team and B team. A team would move out and had to be on location within two hours. B team, which was a backup team, had to be there within four. So uh, I'd be put on alert uh, status when we would be called up to do it, and each unit would provide for that. One day, there was a requirement that the NBC officers go to Fort Belvoir, Virginia to go ahead and get some additional training. So I drove our OIC, which is officer in charge of our team, to Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Upon arriving at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, there was this old theater like and all the officers weren't there. We stayed on the outside, the drivers did. Long about chow time, the drivers decided they were gonna go to the snack bar. I didn't have a whole lot of money at that time because I sent most of my money back to my mother. Uh, but I made some sandwiches and stuff of this sort and took with me so I'd have something to eat, you know. 
and there was an airman there. And with both of us being there, we decided, well, let's go inside, see if we can find a place to eat. Both of us went inside. There were no heavily armed guards, which everyone says that seems strange, and I admit it seems strange. But we went in with no problem. We saw this stairway leading up to the balcony, so we thought we'd go on up there because the officers were still in the auditorium. So we thought we'd just go up there and sit and eat. So we went on upstairs, we looked out. When we looked out, they were showing movies. And the film they were showing showed a typical UFOs, uh, a typical different types of aliens, both dead and alive. Uh, the, the movie was made up of both stills and film footage. And we first thought, well, they're watching science fiction trailers. And it was kind of like levity put into some serious subject, we thought. So while we watched what was going on, we tried to identify the movies, because both of us thought we had seen quite a few sci-fi movies, but we couldn't identify the movies from which the film clips were from. Then all of a sudden we realized we wasn't alone in the room. We went ahead, was escorted out, actually pushed most of the time down the stairs. And they kept telling us, do we have any understanding or idea what kind of trouble we were in? They had a panel van on the outside, meaning it had no windows or nothing. They put us inside of that, pushed us inside of that panel van. Did not have no lights on, it was total dark back there. Uh, drove us to an undisclosed location. And I don't want to get into it at this time, but for four nights and five days with me, I was ha put through what they call inter uh, intensified interrogation. The airman, he got out of it a little earlier. When I got back to my unit, we were both told never to say anything about what happened to anyone. When I got back to my unit, it was on a Friday night. Uh, the only thing I wanted to do was get some sleep. So I went to bed. Saturday morning, I was woke up by the CQ charge of quarters, and he directed me to go down to the first sergeant's office that I was needed there in the orderly room. So I went on to the orderly room, went to the first sergeant's office, and the first sergeant wasn't there. Then I was called into the unit commander's office. When I went back there, the two gentlemen that were doing the intensified interrogation, they were there. So they went ahead and asked me what happened for the week. And I said, what do you mean? Well, you were AWOL for a week. And I said, no, sir, I was not AWOL. What were you doing? I was following orders. And these were the same two people that put me through the interrogation. And they said, no, you were not here for the two week, or for the week. I said, I wasn't here, but I was following orders. And they said, okay, are you gonna tell us where you were at or not? So I was wondering what was going on. So I uttered something to the effect that you know what happened, you were there. Then one of them went really ballistic for lack of a better term. And he went ahead and said, I told you we should have shot him. I told you we should have not let him just leave there. And he even pulled out a weapon and said, I say we just shoot him right now to ensure he keeps quiet. We'll call it a training accident. Well, what happened was the other guy said, calm down, calm down, go get us some sandwiches and coffee. So he went out ranting and raving as he went out. So finally he went ahead, the guy had stayed behind. And now I'd call it the good cop, bad cop routine. He went ahead and was talking to me and says, look, you know that UFOs are real. You have had experiences. And your country needs to u utilize you in those experiences. We want to make you a part of a team which isn't put together. It's loosely knit. You do your job here, but in the event of a UFO event or incident within this location, you would be utilized. Now, if you're willing to do that, we'll go ahead and forget about the AWOL. If you're willing to do that, you will be made to understand certain things that we know. 
but you will also be in a position to learn a whole lot more. And it makes no real difference. By the end of the year, the truth is going to come out anyhow. While well, they were talking about the Condon Committee report. At the end of the year, it came out, but did not say anything about the reality of UFOs. By the end of the year, I knew what our government was doing. But initially I said, well, no, I really don't want to do this. And they went ahead and said, well, we'd like for you to change your mind because you could be court-martialed for that, for the AWOL. It says the one thing you can really be court-martialed for is that you're in the wrong branch of service. Well, I was just a young kid at that time. And I couldn't understand what do you mean, the wrong branch of service. And he gave me my enlistment contract. He says, what does it say here you enlisted in? I said, it says Army. He says, read it. I said, I've been in the Army for what, eight months now? And he says, read it. The oath has United States Air Force. The front of the DDD Form 4 on the very first page said that I had read and understood Air Force, uh, Air Force Form 117. Uh, I wasn't in the Air Force, I was in the Army. So they were making it as though that this was a terrible breach of my contract and that I'd, I'd had cost the U.S. taxpayer a lot of money. Now all I had to do was re-enlist for three years, go ahead, uh, do what they wanted me to do, and play ball with the program. And I would be able to go ahead and uh, to have my records changed where it said Army. Uh, there would be no charges brought up against me. And I was told I had till Monday to make the decision. Monday morning, one of two things would happen. I would uh, be hit up on charges. Charge sheets would be uh, drawn up and an Article 32 investigation pursued, which was an investigation to determine if there was sufficient evidence to take you to trial. And I was appraised of the fact there was sufficient evidence to take me to trial. So after they hit up on that for the weekend, I still felt uncomfortable re-enlisting. But I decided, fine, I'd do it. So I re-enlisted. And it wasn't a choice. Monday morning, I re-enlisted. End of discussion. They had the paperwork already done. And they were pretty sure I was going to. That's why they had the paperwork done. But I went ahead, took my re-enlistment, got that, and nothing happened for some time. Then we had a situation uh, where the initial situation was at uh, Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. We went there on a field training exercise. Uh, being a civil affairs unit, they had certain scenarios they had to play out. Well, while we were there at that particular location, we were notified that there was an NBC incident that occurred and that a plane went down and it had radiological equipment on it, or radiological weapons. So we had to move out. There was already a team there when we got there and they had everything set up. But once we got there and upon our arrival, uh, as we got closer and closer to the mound of Earth, we could see that there was an aircraft there. But none of us could identify what the craft was. I drove a deuce and a half because the deuce and a half had all my field equipment, uh, the radios, the switchboard, uh, the NBC equipment. Uh, up on getting there, uh, they went ahead and told me that, you know, they wanted me to go towards the object itself and uh, take radiological readings. I went towards it, and as I got closer and closer, the readings would go up, but then they'd go down, up, down. I now know why that happened. It's the, pro the propulsion system. The propulsion system they use will initially give off a lot of background radiation, but it dissipates in a matter of minutes. But they wanted me to go ahead and get as close to the object as I could. So I kept going, and I got 
up to where I could look down into the mound where it was at. Uh, the crap was like a hill shape, and uh, they had a canopy, but on each side of the canopy. And the only way I can describe it is like a kidney shape hatch that was open and there was a body lying up there and you could immediately tell it wasn't human. Uh, I started to call for an officer because I needed an officer to come there to see what I was seeing. This wasn't real, this wasn't something that was supposed to be happening. And they told me, no, just describe what you're seeing. And I said, no, I really need an officer up here. I said, you don't understand, I really need an officer up here. Uh, no one came. Eventually they said, that's fine, send him on back down. Then they told me to go back into the deuce and a half. That some field phones had already been set up from there. I would operate the switchboard at SP-22. And I was to stay there until I was later notified to come out that all rations of the day would be sea rations, and there were sea rations in the truck. I wasn't to look out at the truck or nothing else from that all, that point on. So that was the initial start. And from there on, there were other events that occurred. A lot of people think that you're in a unit just waiting for the next UFO event. That's not it. You actually had a real job you did in the military, but you had a double life. And on more than one occasion, we had situations where we were called out. There in the United States, I had several. In Germany, I had several, which covered all of Europe. In Vietnam, we had several incidences. But I think the biggest thing about going on these events was you couldn't talk to nobody. You had to keep it bottled up. You couldn't tell your family what you were doing. Being a clerk, I shouldn't go all that t TDY. I shouldn't be gone for weeks, months at a time. Mommy kids, they didn't understand that. And just this last, last month, I went on vacation. My two sons were throwing it up to me about Dad, you missed out on a lot of occasions with us. And I tried to explain to him it wasn't because I didn't want to be there. But I've already told them events that happened. And my oldest son started to recall what I had said prior with the death of my son uh, in 95, because then I started to tell them. My granddaughter, I think I've told the most to because she asked. And she really took an interest in what I was saying about what happened. But I think people that were involved in this, the people who went out there and did the recoveries, who seen the things that they have to live with day to day, they really need to tell their families. I got disillusioned with it when I found out the things we were doing to people. I got disillusioned with it when I found out Knowing the truth, we would cause people to lose their families, lose their jobs, and at times they'd even take their lives. And to me, there was nothing right about this. What purpose can it serve by telling these people who've had these events, who actually were the response people who went to these locations where these events took place, to try to tell them that there's a prosaic explanation when they knew better. But the end result, they're traumatized and there isn't no help out there. If you go and tell somebody about a UFO event or experience you had, immediately your sanity comes into question. Immediately, people question your integrity. And that's what these people have to deal with. So what do you do? You bottle it up when you say nothing. That's the safe thing. But it really isn't safe because it comes back to haunt you. So right now what I would like is for people who have been out there, who have been involved in this, 
to tell their families what they were involved with. I had an officer, and a lot of you people in the field know me. When I talked in Washington, D.C., he was involved in an incident. He came up and he asked me, how did they talk? I said, you heard them in your head. I said, it was just like you and I talking right now. And you thought you were hearing voices, but you heard them in your head. And I told him that in, during the event that you went through, you probably heard them say something like, do not be afraid, we are not going to harm you. Nothing bad is going to happen. But it is necessary we show what we could do if we were really here with hostile intent. He acknowledged that. He never told anybody, no one, about that, not even his family. And he acknowledged, yes, that's exactly what happened. And I've never told no one. And I said, what are you going to do about it? And he said, I'm going to go home, hug my wife, tell her I love her, and tell her what happened. And to the best of my knowledge, there's a couple of people who in the field that know about that. But they've never reached the name of that person. And that's the way it needs to be. It's up to that individual to come forth and tell what really happened, the, the rest of the story. I tell you I've seen a UFO. I tell you that we made a report about it, that certain things happened. I can be comfortable with that, and you can accept that, whether you believe in extraterrestrials or not. But when I tell you the rest of the story, then it becomes diff very difficult for the person to really comprehend what a person went through. Also, it becomes very difficult for the person who has decided to come out of the closet, so to speak, and state that for 20 plus years, I was involved in a program involving the recovery of, tra of crashed UFOs and debris thereof. Crashes are very rare, very rare. The recovery of debris or items left behind are not so rare. To be sure, they're pretty common. A person that's involved in an incident one time, as this person was, it becomes very difficult for them to tell the whole story, even when they want to. But there are those, in order to have peace of mind, starting with family, they need to tell. And I guess that's the message I want to get out. If we keep going in the direction we're going in, we ultimately are going to fall victim to our own technology and ultimately destroy ourselves. Either you go spiritually with your technology or you fall victim to it. Here it is, we say the Cold War's over, the threat of nuclear exchange is behind us, but we've already fallen victim because terrorists are thinking about using dirty bombs. The greed of man provides the materials to do that. The desire to not have secrets have it on the internet on how you can make a dirty bomb. So it's not the governments anymore that's in, that is in total charge of that awesome technology. They can't do as good at it as organized governments can in laboratories making all the nice nuclear weapons and all the nice ballistic missiles to, as delivery systems. But they can make crude weapons. And I would remind everybody that a Stone Age spear can kill you just as easy as an AR-15 can today. So it doesn't have to be uh, a highly sophisticated 
device, nuclear device, which would be a dirty bomb, but you would also have the aftermath of it going off. We really need to get to the point where we start to become more spiritual in our involvement with one another. We have to care what happens to one another. And I'm not talking religion here. I'm talking about what's in every person. There's that drive to really want to care what happens to other people. There is that adage once we go ahead and get to that spiritual plateau where we can really apply it within our lives that there but for the grace of God go I. And if we get to the point where we really want to go ahead and be concerned about the other person, this world's going to be a much, much better world to live in. Until that happens, we are a world in quarantine. We will be able to explore our own little solar system. We will be able to look beyond the envelope. But we won't be able to go out and explore the cosmos. We will fall victim to our technology long before that happens. Unless we grow spiritually. If we grow spiritually, the day isn't too awful far off then that we will be going into the cosmos. We will be visiting other worlds. At some point, we will be the aliens and we will be someone else's UFOs. Well, upon my arrival in Roswell, New Mexico, I was assigned to the uh, ROTC unit uh, here at NIMI. Uh, some of the people that was over me did not like the idea that I was involved in UFOs. So they gave me what they called a lawful order not to go ahead, f uh, filled FOIA acts uh, for information, not to correspond with senators, not to go ahead and correspond with anybody uh, in any type of government agency dealing with UFOs or requesting information on UFOs. Uh, I considered that an e illegal order, so I continued to do it. Uh, the end result was they went ahead, they relieved me of my duty, they forced me to undergo a psychological evaluation, which dare I say I came through it with flying collars. Uh, the one nice thing about it was they said, guy's not crazy. If he's done something he should be court-martialed for, by all means court-martial him. Uh, they tried to go ahead and force me to retire. Then they wanted to go ahead and process a disciplinary discharge on me. I resisted all of that. At one point, my executive officer called me into his office and said, okay, you're gonna tell me everything you know about UFOs. We're not leaving until you do. I said, well, sir, do you mind if I smoke? If I smoke? And he said, no, go right ahead. It's time I smoke cigars. So I lit up a cigar. And he says, okay, you ready to talk? I said, you gonna call your wife, sir? And he said, why do I need to call my wife? I said, because, sir, if you're waiting for me to tell you anything, it's going to be a cold day in hell, and we're going to be here for a long time. This is information your wife should know. He then went ahead and said, well, I'm not mad at you. I just don't think you should be doing this. And besides, what difference does it make to you if the Pentagon has 50 flying saucers of extraterrestrial origin? At which time I told him, Sir, you have the luxury of not knowing the truth. Unfortunately, I do not share that same luxury.